part of the Press Play Podcast Network. The 1 1 pitch. A swing and a drive to deep right. Away back. Go! Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Guardians of the Land MLB podcast. I'm your host, John Tellich. We're at the All Star break, as you all well know. Jose Ramirez representing. The Cleveland Guardians in Seattle, Emmanuel Classe, was selected to be there. He chose to go to the Dominican Republic, some situation at his home in dealing with that. Hope all is well for Emmanuel Classe and his family as they move forward. Josh Naylor, well documented how fine he played in the first half of the season. He was very productive at the plate, but he was not selected to be on the roster, so he will perhaps fuel himself a bit for the second half of the season to let everybody know they made a mistake in not allowing him to be part of the festivities. And as we sit here right now, the Guardians at 45 and 45, they are in first place by a half game over the Minnesota Twins. And bear in mind that four of the five teams in the division, the Central Division, lost their last game before the All-Star break, the Guardians among those teams that did just that. In fact, they lost two of three to the Braves in the second last series before the break. And that, of course, was thanks to eight home runs by Atlanta, just playing great, great baseball so far this season. And you contrast what Atlanta can do at the plate with the power with what the Guardians have been unable to do this year. Guardians, by the way, only three times have they had back-to-back home runs in a game. So they need more power in the second half of the season. They did win the first two games in that final series at Progressive Field against the Royals, and then they dropped a 4-1 decision to the Royals on that final day before the All-Star break. That was the last game of the so-called first half, although, as you all know, they have 90 games in the books with just, oh, that would make it uh, 72 more to go to finish with the 162. Bieber, by the way, took the loss in that last game. What was the biggest story of the first half of baseball this year in 2023? Well, I think you would imagine going into the season, all the trepidation, the worry about whether or not players would adhere to the pitch clock and how much that would change the uh, dimensions of each and every baseball game. Well, I think we got our answers fairly quickly, and it proved to be consistent through the first half of the season. The pitch clock was very, very effective. The Washington Post will give them the credit for dragging up these stats to get those stats towards you. 99 games, I should say 99 days of the 2022 season, games lasted an average of three hours and four minutes. And then according to the Washington Post, in this season, 99 days of 2023 and the average time of each game shrinking down to two hours and 38 minutes. And I can cite many times that we were watching games that were only about two hours and 10 to 15 minutes in length. And they just kind of cut out a lot of that stuff that was just, you know, players adjusting their gloves and pitchers stepping off the mound and all those types of things. So we had much quicker baseball and I thought the product was better as well. So that 99 days in the first part of this season of 2023 and two hours and 38 minutes, the shortest uh, since the 1984 Major League Baseball campaign. There was more running, of course, more chances to take off and steal bases. As you all know, the bases were a bit bigger, so less room to run. And then you had the restrictions on the ability to throw over to first base to hold the runner on. So you had 1.5 stolen bases per game. That's the highest in decades. 
and they were 79% successful in their rates in order of uh, the attempted steals and then the actual success rate. And that was the highest in 25 years. Again, shout out to the Washington Post. They were the folks that were able to drag up and dredge those numbers and provided them to us. So another big story, of course, is that the attendance in Major League Baseball on a whole is up. There were some very significant stories. None the least is uh, the one of Shohei Otani sitting there with that large amount of home runs. He's going to have to catch up a bit in his pace to see if he perhaps could uh, do better than Aaron Judge did last season. But by and large, Shohei Otani, what he's doing both at the plate and on the hill, his ability to strike out Uh, uh, batters is just absolutely unbelievable. And he's having a fantastic year as well. So the attendance is up in Major League Baseball. And I think the pace of the game certainly is uh, a big factor in some of those stats being on the good side, if you will. Well, they're 45 and 45, as I mentioned before, through 90 games. They are in first by that half game over Minnesota. Let's compare to a year ago, last season, when they were 44 and 44. They were three and a half games behind uh, in the race for the division championship. And we all know what happened after the all-star break is that they absolutely caught fire, played outstanding uh, baseball in the second half of the season. The Tito teams kind of do that uh, historically, if you will. They were 48 and 26, and they won their division by a huge margin. They won it by double digits, 11 games, and certainly doing outstanding in terms of uh, their ability to play very good baseball in the second half of the season. Well, I'm certainly not banking on them playing that kind of baseball in the second half of the season. It would be a welcome sight. But I think if you're a realistic person following the Guardians this year, I don't think that you can sit back and say, by and large, you can bank on them going 48 and 26, uh, that type of a percentage of uh, victories in the second half. That may be asking a bit too much. But hey, who am I, right? The attendance this year, and this is according to an article done by Jeff Shadell, the fine writer who does sports on many levels, not the least of which at the Willoughby News Herald for both the Guardians and the Browns. He wrote a story about the attendance, and at the moment when he published it, uh, Major League Baseball, well, over 40 dates at uh, Progressive Field was up almost 44 percent in its attendance. They were at 832,070 fans over those 40 dates. That's an average of 20,802. Now contrast that to the year of 2022, just last season, they had drawn at that point of the season 578,148. That was an average of about 14,454 per contest. And Jeff also points out, and thanks for digging up these stats, Jeff, that uh, eight times they had uh, uh, games where the fan total was 30,000 on north of that. So more than 30,000 fans on eight of those occasions at the point where they had 40 dates at home. Now, of course, there are some ways that we can look at the reasons for them having much better success at the turnstiles, if you will. And you would suggest that, well, they were coming off a very good season. They took the Yankees to the fifth game in the ALDS, almost got to the American League Championship Series. There was a lot of optimism coming forward. They did make a few moves, which they hoped would work out. But in some ways, some of those did not. But hence, though, at this stage, With the attendance that they have, you could point that they had the great success a year ago, and that boosted somewhat some of the enthusiasm heading into this year. They had that crazy uh, promotion where you would buy for the entire month a pass for standing room only in the ballpark. And I know each and every month that that is offered, it sells out. So that's a pretty uh, interesting way to uh, count the turnstiles, if you will. And they had some of the more marquee teams come into 
uh, progressive field in the first part of the season. Very early in the season, the Yankees visited, and then very late in the first half, as I pointed out just a few moments ago, you had the Atlanta Braves in town uh, taking on the Guardians. Uh, they will play, of course, six fewer games in their division. And I think I think that has an effect as well. You're not seeing the Royals 19 times. It's it's great to see them 19 times when you can beat the pants off of them. But I think just for the fans to be able to have more variety of teams that come into the ballpark, I think that's very effective if you're not seeing your divisional opponents like the Royals and the Tigers 19 times. You see them 13 times. And of course, there are more interleague games by and large because of that. You have 46 interleague games as opposed to 20. So, so far in the season, before the All Star break, they played five series against interleague teams, five interleague series games at the ballpark. And that certainly, I think, has also helped attendance with people getting a chance to see some of those teams they don't get the opportunity to see that frequently. So those five interleague series that, of course, will continue. The trend will continue in the second half of the season. Next to come into progressive field will be the Philadelphia Phillies. That's on July the 21st. And then in August, the Los Angeles Dodgers come here, which will be great, I think, for fans to see the Dodgers at progressive field. And then Cincinnati in September as well. So I think those are some of the factors for uh, baseball having some pretty good attendance and absolutely for progressive field to enjoy the point where they're at about 830 to 40,000 fans already over the first 40 dates of the season. Not too shabby. We're going to take a little break here and then come back with more as we recap the first half. Look ahead to the second half of the season for your Cleveland Guardians on the Guardians of the Land MLB podcast. I'm John Tellish, back in just a quick second or two. What's up, everyone? I'm Holly Wetzel. And I'm Tigers Powell. And we are your hosts of the Orange is Oranger, a Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. We give you all the dog pound coverage that you'll need to get you through the regular season, hopeful postseason, and I'd say off-season, Tyvis, but is there really ever an off-season for this team? Thankfully for our podcast, Holly, there really never is when it comes to the Cleveland Browns. Don't miss our breakdown of each week's matchup, game recaps, and any and all news out of Berea to feed your Browns appetite. As we know, Holly, dogs gotta eat. Yes, they do. So hit that subscribe button and never miss an episode of the Orange is Oranger Cleveland Browns podcast on the Press Play Podcast Network. Hey, everybody, it's Sam Amico from Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Be sure to give us a listen for all your Cleveland Cavaliers recaps, analysis, breakdowns, draft talk, free agency. The list goes on and on. Give us a listen. Cavs on the Break NBA podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Guardians of the Land MLB podcast. John Tellich here as we are recapping the first half of the season, looking ahead to some of the trends, perhaps, that we will see in the second half of the season as well. Some of the big storylines, other than that attendance being uh, much greater than they had had in 2022. Well, I think the starting pitching with the injuries that we certainly had a huge taste of early in the season with Tristan McKenzie going down so early in the season, then Cal Quantrill on the uh, injured list uh, on a couple of occasions. Aaron Savali's had his issues. As Terry Pluto points out, and I give him credit for this, in the 2022 season, Quantrill, McKenzie, and Bieber, no missed starts. But this year, only Bieber is the only starting pitcher who has yet to miss a start. So certainly, They have not been able to keep their main starting rotation intact and a lot of time on the injured list. That, I think, has affected things to be exact. And if Savali, who uh, pitched fairly well going into the break, if he can get to what he was like in the early stages of the 2021 campaign, I think that can bode 
great dividends for the Guardians in the second half of the season. I think he is a big key as you look forward. You can't afford to have this guy miss starts. He's got to be out there. He has to be consistent. I think uh, with all the speculation about Bieber, uh, whether or not he's still going to be with the team, I think you need Savali to be there and to bolster that starting rotation. Of course, McKenzie's out for quite some time, may not even see him the rest of the way. We'll see, of course. Uh, There's still plenty of baseball to be played and time for him to recover, but I know they're going to go very cautiously with Tristan McKenzie as they move forward. So a few things to look at there in terms of the starting pitching. And on that same note, let's talk about the young kids that came up to the big leagues in the first half of the season and the promise that they can bring to this rotation. Gavin Williams, I think, is absolutely, positively a keeper, and I think he's going to be an outstanding pitcher for many, many years. And I think you could say the same. The potential there is for Tanner Bybee as well. Both of these young men can be difference makers as they move forward rotation-wise, especially in the second half of the season. A lot will be riding on their shoulders. They're also, I'm certain, going to be as cautious as possible. Logan Allen did show some nice signs when he was up. Then he did run into trouble. I think also they want to be safe and uh, concerned with him to make sure that he uh, gets himself righted in AAA. But I would assume we will see Uh, Some more of Mr. Logan Allen this year already. Of course, he's gone down once and we expect to see him back as well. And Tito is pretty good at this type of thing of trying to protect those young arms. So we'll see how they move forward in terms of their young starting staff. But I love what I have seen from Gavin Williams and the same thing for Tanner Bybee. I think there's a lot there. And I think you would more than likely agree that there's huge potential with these guys as they move forward. Now, as we look at some of the bats, guys in the lineup going forward, maybe there's a category we could call what they have done. We need to have done even more so in the second half of the season. And I'm referring, of course, to two guys that are certainly all-star caliber in Jose Ramirez hitting 289 in the first half of the campaign with those 14 home runs and 53 RBI. And then Josh Naylor just having a tremendous first half. It is a shame he's not at the all-star festivities. He hit 305 with 11 home runs, leads the team in RBI, one of the better guys in baseball in terms of being productive and uh, racking up those runs batted in. Now, Guys in the category of need more than what you have, certainly one of the guys at the top of the list can be Ahmed Rosario, hitting 268. He has 91 hits. He has 69 strikeouts in the first half of the season. That's second most on the team. So he did seem to be gearing up a bit before the break. We'll see if he can uh, start out hot in the second half of the season and make it count as they go forward. Andres Jimenez hitting 248. Certainly want to see more coming off an all star campaign. He has 14 doubles and four triples uh, so far this season. Want to see more of the extra base hits and uh, driving in runs, all of those types of things from Andres Jimenez, who uh, certainly can up his production. The big disappointment, as you would probably agree, would be the Josh Bell signing, although we're starting to see some stuff as well towards the end of the first half, but he's only hitting 230. We didn't think he would hit for a huge average per se and way too many strikeouts, 71. That is most on the Guardians team. He does have nine home runs and 42 RBI, but I think we all would agree in the first half of the season, uh, he just was a cog in the machine that wasn't firing properly. And I think there were many nights when had he just made one big hit, it might have been the difference in a win and or a loss. And there were many nights where he just wasn't productive. So we'll see what happens in the second half of the schedule. How about Stephen Kwan hitting 263, played a lot of games. Will that hold up in the second half? He played in 89 of the 90 games, hitting that 263 and could stand to have a bit more production from that young man as they move forward. But certainly a cornerstone, young talent on your baseball team who can help set things up 
and certainly plays an outstanding outfield. And you want those things to continue, but maybe boost uh, the ability just a bit as you move forward. Of course, it's way incomplete on the youngster, the younger of the two Naylor brothers, Bo Naylor, coming up to the big leagues. When he did come up, I recall that they, they it kind of was just maybe a timing thing, but as he came to the bigs, uh, the team went on a pretty good little run, but he is indeed a work in progress. Of course, 15 games, that's not much to take a read on, but in those 15 games, he just uh, jumped right in line with the rest of the catchers who have not been productive at the plate. But he's definitely uh, doing a better job behind the dish uh, than Mike Zanino was in uh, his his ability to block uh, balls in the dirt and those types of things. And uh, we'll see if he can continue to learn more about uh, how to handle a uh, starting rotation, how to handle the pitchers as he goes forward. But there's a lot of promise from Bo Naylor uh, behind the dish for the Guardians. The bullpen, by the way, second in ERA, but it's somewhat misleading in the sense that they've had a bunch of blown saves. And they're number two in blown saves in the league right now. And so they want to, and I think that's a byproduct that you may re- agree as well, a byproduct of the fact that with the few offensive uh, stalwarts on the team this year, they found themselves in so many games where it was absolutely zero portion for them to have any kind of error uh, whatsoever. And they were paying some nights when a reliever was just not sharp on their game and they paid for it. So we'll see what happens there. Big question in the second half of the season. Will we see Shane Bieber wearing a Guardians uniform beyond the trade deadline? And you could certainly argue for both ways you have to bear in mind of course they have a surplus of middle infielders will they cobble some of those assets together to try to to uh, help their offensive production and keep Bieber or will they do everything in their power just to take the best thing available at the time to deal him away Uh, you could make arguments both ways to make the deals for uh to slightly upgrade the lineup and hope Everybody else not necessarily catches fire, but just clicks a little bit better. That probably would be enough to uh, withstand the Twins or any of the other teams, obviously, in the division and uh, get to the playoffs and then take your chances from there. We'll see. Uh, Will we see Oscar Gonzalez in the second half? There's been rumors to the effect that we will. He's been hitting very well down in Columbus. So it will be nice to see if uh, SpongeBob SquarePants, is that how you say it? I, I always mess it up. But if, yeah, if uh, if SpongeBob makes it uh, to the big leagues, we'd love to, love to see the young man with the uh, infectious kind of enthusiasm that he had uh, last year. And he just seemed to be a bit lost early in the season. We'll see if he can help out. As they uh, begin the season on Friday, it's out on the road. They have a couple of series out on the road. The first one will be in Texas. And I know uh, several of the players uh, have just decided to kind of like spend uh, their time down in that area so they can be easily uh, uh, transferred, if you will, or moved over towards to the ballpark and to be able to start the second half of the season. There will be like a voluntary workout at Progressive Field uh, on Thursday, and then they will head to Texas to Start that series with the Rangers, and as I mentioned, Aaron Savali, who I think is really key in the second half of the season. Uh, He will have the start for the Guardians in that game on Saturday. The youngster, Gavin Williams, look for more of the uh, very solid pitching that we've seen for the most part from him in his first start of the second half. And then Tanner Bybee gets the final start of that series. And then Monday in Pittsburgh, it's the Beebs. And then on Tuesday, that is to be determined as we stand here and uh, record this podcast. So there's a lot to look forward to. Get down on your knees and say thank you very much for the absolute joy that it is to be in the division that they're in. If they were in any other one, obviously, it would be uh, uh, they would not be looking at playoff potential, but they're fortunate to be in the Central Division. We'll see what they can do with it in the second half of the season. It's been really a lot of fun to do the pod as this 
season has gone along each and every week. I've tried to have a guest on where I can maybe dive a bit into that person's past, whether it was Sandy Alomar or Jensen Lewis or Bobby DiBiasio or folks that, uh, you know, have been parts of this team, Matt Underwood, who's the voice of them on, on, on television, uh, and then talk more about the assets on the field and who needs to play better and what aspects of uh, baseball in the uh, first half of the season can be translated to the second half. So look forward to more of that. And I thank uh, once again, folks like Andre Knott, who have stopped by and have done uh, interviews with me. It's been a lot of fun to chat with those folks and kind of expand our conversations about not just their past, but what's been going on with the baseball team. So look forward to more of that type of stuff when we come back with you in a couple of, of weeks. Now, we are here on this Press Play Podcast Network. There's so many other real good podcasts, our basketball podcast. We've got, of course, the Roadman and Reg Eye. You have the Sable Brothers from the sidelines, the Fanfare, one of our newer pods here on the Press Play Podcast Network. Check that out. Orange is Oranger. To- so many things. I know the Bull is doing a podcast about uh, television. And so take your pick and check out the assortment of podcasts that are available on the Press Play Podcast Network. Well, that's going to do it. As I mentioned, a short little kind of touch up, if you will, take the temperature of the team at the break, get excited for the second half of the season, the 72 games from here on out towards the end of September, early October, when hopefully they will be uh, sitting there as the divisional champs and then take their chances in the playoffs of 20. 20- 23. Thanks for listening, everybody. This is John Tellich. This is the Guardians of the Land MLB podcast right here on the Press Play Podcast Network. And we will catch you the next time around. Thanks for listening.